Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the P and Applied Mathematics Seminar. It's a pleasure for me to open session 64 of this seminar. Uh, today, we had two excellent speakers, Alexandra Astolfi and Bingyu Sang. Introducing Alexandra Astolfi, we have to Professor Lauren Prove. Thank you, Lauren. You can start. Thank you, Juan. So, good afternoon for everyone. It's a huge pleasure to introduce Professor Alessandro Astolf today. He's a professor of nonlinear control theory at the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at Imperial College London, where he is also a college consul for Faculty of Engineering and Business School. And also since 2005, he is also a professor at the University of Rome Tor Vergata. He has more than 17,000 citations and an H index 62 as well. His area of expertise in partial differential equations covered topics related with optical control, control theory, adaptive and robust control problems, and also game theory problems. And his talk is entitled The Curse of Linearity and Time Invariance. So, Professor Stolfi, you can start. Thank you very much. Thanks for the kind invitation and for the nice introduction. So it is a pleasure. Now, I understand you are a mathematician and I'm not a mathematician. So uh, hopefully this is not gonna be too trivial for you or, or, or you know, too, 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 well, not enough uh, conceptual, but okay. So essentially uh, the purpose of this presentation is to, well, discuss uh, a few encounters that I have with control theory and dynamical system theory, uh, where I believe uh, uh, whenever you start thinking in terms of linear system and time invariant system, you actually uh, you actually have a problem because you don't see exactly what's going on. And so the whole idea is to state that linearity and time invariance are a course. And so we need to think in more abstract way, even when we are dealing with linear systems. All right. So uh, essentially, this seminar is, is you know typically is a good opportunity to reflect on you know the past and and look at the future. So in terms of my research career, I have spent about you know, 20 plus years looking at linear object from a nonlinear perspective. And this is why I believe that linearity and time invariance are actually a curse. So they are a curse because they confuse our intuition, delay our understanding. And most of the time, I mean, we struggle to expand the linear way of thinking to more general classes of system. And, you know, from a general mathematical perspective, I think that, you know, linearity and time invariance are pretty much like Euclidean geometry, where uh, you have this notion of orthogonality and which you believe uh, has to be, you know, satisfied by everything. And then just, you know, later on, you realize that actually this is just one possible notion of orthogonality. Now, uh, before spending the rest of my career, hopefully another 20 plus year, trying to understand more linear objects, I would like to reflect on the lessons that I've learned up to now. So, right. I will use a very simple notation in this lecture. So it's like a traffic light notation, which I typically use when I teach. So, you know, with the obvious meaning that green is, 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 is a good result, amber is something that requires a bit of reflection and red uh, actually is not a good result. And then I also use this small symbol L and TI to say that something is uh, linearly cursed or is cursed from a time uh, invariance perspective. All right, so how do we break the course of linearity and time invariance? So my recipe for this is very simple. I will start studying linear and time invariant systems. However, in doing this, I would like to avoid any linear tool. So I would like to avoid metric multiplication and inversion because they are meaningful, you know, whenever you use linear algebra, but clearly you cannot extend this to general nonlinear system. Whenever you perform differentiation, you need to keep track of constant terms that may be constant because your system is linear or time invariant, but in general, not constant terms. And so this term disappear in a linear time invariant frame work, but actually are there if you consider more general classes of system. Clearly, the use of frequency domain and Laplace transform tools uh, uh, is not a good idea. Uh, if you really have to use matrices, you should not use inverse of matrices, and then you need to understand that matrices are acting on something. And, you know, the, we will see some example in which, you know, you have a matrix that actually act as itself or act as a Jacobian. And again, this is one of the situations where the linear perspective 
uh, is not particularly useful because you cannot really distinguish between a matrix acting on something and the Jacobian of a map. Whereas in the nonlinear framework, you need to distinguish between these. So my idea is to replace uh, linear algebra with notion like interconnection invariance, some particular PDEs, which are most of the time associated with notion of invariance, the use of coordinate transformation and a basic principle like the principle of optimality and dynamic programming, properties of trajectories and differential operator and graph theory. All right, so this talk is actually divided into five parts. Uh, and uh, in the first three, we'll discuss some analysis problems, uh, mostly do, to do with uh, modeling, uh, um, you know, dynamical system and model reduction. Uh, and then in the second part, I deal with control problem with in particular, with particular emphasis on adaptive control and optimal control. And, you know, these are work, this is all work done with either former PhD students or colleagues that you know, are listed here in these slides. All right, so what is a moment? Now, uh, moments are actually, with different names, uh, ubiquitous in math, physics, and biology. And so informally, I can define the moment theta m as an integral on some domain of a distance at some power times a density function integrated over the domain. Now, in probability, we all know that, you know, zero order moment is one by definition of density probability, and then you have the classical mean, variance, skewness, and you can name them all. Um, in mechanics, you have the notion of moment of force and torque, and these are first order moments. The moment of inertia, for example, is a second order moment. Phasors, which shows up in the analysis of linear circuit, are first order moment. Um, electrical dipole is also first order moment. Cell density is a zero order moment. So you see that in every branch of of uh, you know, science, quantitative science, I should say, uh, you have, uh, you're using a notion of moments. Now, what about system theory? Well, in system theory, you can look at the function H, which maps T into R, and then you define the moment of an, as an integral, where pretty much as in the previous case, where actually this integral is a weighted integral and the notion of distance is actually related to time. So if H is the impulse response of a linear time invariant system, which is represented in state space form, then you can do a Laplace transform, which immediately is linear decursed because you cannot really extend this to more general system. And then you see that the zero moment at some point in the complex plane is not else the devaluation of the transfer function at this point of the complex plane. And then if you're interested in higher order moment, there is an interesting relationship between the power m that you get in the integral definition and the derivative of the transfer function. So you see these objects, which are actually, you know, the result of sampling the transfer function on the complex plane, they are linearly cursed because uh, you uh, are using a tool, the transfer function and the Laplace transform, which requires clearly, clearly linearity and time invariance. And then you're evaluating these at the point in the complex plane. So uh, a point in the complex plane doesn't make much sense when you start dealing with uh, probably time invariant systems and nonlinear systems. So we need to try to understand what is a good notion of moment in system theory. Now, a simple way of doing this is to observe that I can actually rewrite the notion of the zero moment as the product of C. And rather than looking at the S star inverse minus A, I S star minus A inverse times B, I can actually define a new matrix pi. And then, you know, left, uh, yes, left multiplying by S star identity minus A, I actually obtain an equation for pi. So pi is defined through this equation that, you know, you will probably recognize as a Sylvester equation. And this in a certain sense, I mean, it's very basic Sylvester equation because you know here we have just a complex number s star there is still a bit of curse of linearity because of the presence of s star but immediately as soon as you have a sylvester equation you realize that this is associated with the notion of invariance and invariance is a much deeper tool than a transfer function so we will be able to use invariance for general nonlinear system now if you have um, K order moments, then you can still characterize the collective set of moments from zero up to K through uh, a Sylvester equation. And so the moments are actually the product of C pi and you see pi is defined through, you know, the second term in this, in this definition and then pi satisfies this uh, uh, Sylvester equation. And again, what we have, we have that rather than picking at the point S, we need to find the matrix I so with the characteristic and minimal polynomial, which is given by S minus star power K 
plus one, and then we uh, formulate the Sylvester equation in this way. Now, there is still a bit, of course, of linearity because of the presence of a star, but the interesting observation is that now we are looking at the matrix. And so, you know, S star is a session related to the characteristic polynomial of the matrix, and so to the modes of this, to the trajectory that you can generate out of a linear system, which you can write as omega dot equal s omega. And this is pretty much what we are doing, right? So rather than looking at the moment in the Laplace transform domain, we actually consider an interconnected system, which is driven by a generator. And this generator captured the interpolation point. Then we have an output, which we define as u equal L omega, and we cascade the generator with the underlying system, the moment of which we would like to compute. Now, at this point, it's actually straightforward to show that provided the no resonance condition is satisfied. So this means that uh, the uh, eigenvalue, the real part of the eigenvalue of uh, sigma is in the closed the right half of the complex plane. The pair SL is observable. And we also need an additional assumption that we'll discuss as we progress, which I call excitability. So this together with an asymptotic stability property for the underlying system tells us that the moment of the system are actually equivalent equivalent, uh, you know, in a one-to-one -one relation with the matrix pi, which is the solution of the Sylvester equation and the steady state response, which is well defined for this interconnection. But now you see that in a certain sense, we have gone completely away from the transfer function characterization and we are looking at an interconnection-based approach. And we know that once we perform this interconnection under this non-resonant condition, as a matter of fact, we have an invariant, uh, we have an invariant subspace uh, for general nonlinear system will be an invariant manifold. And so we will be able to characterize moments in general. Now, alternatively, and we will come back to this uh, in the course of the seminar, you can also assign an input to uh, the, the signal generator, and then you can look at the impulse response of the cascaded system. And again, you have a one-to-one -one relation between the steady state response, the moment, and the matrix pi. Now, clearly, once you send an input to the generator, you can swap the system and the interpolation point. And, you know, again, from a linear perspective, you would assume that this doesn't really make any big difference to the whole uh, interpretation. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't. But, you know, we need to be slightly more careful uh, if we want to avoid any linear way of thinking. So again, we have an underlying system, which is asymptotically stable and is driven by an impulse in this case. Then the output of the system is driving what we can call a signal generator, but perhaps we should call this a filter. Again, we have some non-resonance condition, a notion of controllability for the system with state omega. And then we can actually relate uh, the steady state response of this cascade to the notion of moment and to a new matrix epsilon, uh, which is actually related to a non-observability non condition. Now, this non-observability condition actually relies on the linearity of the cascade. And most of the time, this type of approach require, relies on the notion of duality. And again, duality is not a tool that we would like to particularly use uh, uh, you know, in, um, in general, because for non-linear system, uh, we will be struggling to use, uh, you know, to use duality. All right, now just to summarize and to give a bit of historical perspective, uh, the two matrices that have introduced pi and epsilon are actually called the Krilov projector and were introduced by Krilov uh, about you know, 100 years ago, 90 years ago. Uh, Krilov was a marine engineer and he was interested in small oscillation of, of, of ships. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, he ended up introducing these two matrices and the associated Sylvester equation. Now, uh, Pi and epsilon, they contain exactly the same information, which are the moment of the system at particular frequencies, which are associated to the eigenvalues of the matrix S. Right, so is this interconnection approach good to extend the notion of moment to nonlinear system? And then clearly there's another number of questions that we want to address as we progress. Okay, now, as a matter of fact, uh, there's not much work that we need to do for, to go from linear to nonlinear. Clearly, I mean, as we go more general, we need to be slightly more careful with our assumption, but suppose that the interpolation points is now not a set of complex number, but is simply a dynamical system, a general nonlinear dynamical system with output. Um, the eigenvalue condition is replaced by a notion of Poisson stability. The observability stays the same, excitability stays the same. Again, we'll come back to this. And then uh, this generator, is driving a, a system which we assume as a zero equilibrium, which is locally asymptotically stable. Under this assumption, we can actually define a steady state response, and the steady state response can be defined, can be used to define the moment. Now, 
observe that there's no linear way of thinking in this in this perspective and clearly the arrows are not going in both direction because uh, uh, we don't really have a notion of moment for nonlinear systems so we need to take these as our definition of moment right interestingly enough uh, you can characterize the steady state response through uh, uh, an invariance partial differential equation so this partial differential equation is the nonlinear enhancement of the sylvester equation and the moment of the system and nothing else than the composition of h with pi so the uh, clearly you know there is omega which shows up so the moment are in this case are functions they're not constant anymore but you know h pi times omega in the linear framework is nothing else than c uh, pi times omega in the linear framework all right so essentially the signal generator is not composed anymore by um you know, a bunch of complex numbers, a complex point, point in the complex plane, but it actually captured the requirement that we're interested in studying the behavior of the system under given circumstances. So we are interested in studying the system for a particular input signal. Now, the interconnected system has an invariant manifold and the dynamic restricted to this manifold are nothing else than a copy of the dynamic of the signal generator. And so by definition, the mapping H pi describes the moment of the nonlinear system at S omega. Right, so if we now want to look at the swap interconnection, again, things are straightforward now that we are not exploiting uh, any, any linear uh, perspective. So you have a nonlinear non -linear control system, which is driven by an impulse. We assume that the impulse response is well-defined. For example, the system is an affine system. Uh, the zero equilibrium is asymptotically stable. Everything is then driving a post filter. So a filter that is processing the output, the measurement Y and uh, uh, we, um, you know, from there, we need to take some assumption, again, for some stability, controllability. Uh, we need an additional assumption, which is a converging input, converging, uh, converging state assumption. Uh, and then uh, we can actually claim that the non-observability property of this cascade is related to the moment of the system. Now, things are actually slightly more complex in this case, because we cannot really write an invariance PDE. Uh, what we need to do, we need to exploit the invariance PDE that we have derived in the previous case. And then we construct a mapping rho. Uh, the mapping rho is such that rho composed with pi is equal to the identity. And the moment of the system are nothing else than the Jacobian of rho times the Jacobian of f with respect to u. And so this is the matrix epsilon that we have seen up to now. Now, so this essentially tells us that the interconnection approach, uh, you know, with the proper assumption is adequate to extend the notion of moment to nonlinear system. Now let's try to um, understand a bit more what is going on, right? So the first observation that we can make is regarding to the uh, Sylvester equation. Now uh, the, the Sylvester equation uh, actually shows up in electrical engineering in what is called the phasor transform. And then it defines the phasor of a linear circuit at phasor angular frequencies. So the component of pi are nothing else than the phasor of the currents and of the integral of the currents of a general linear circuit. Now, the phasor of the output response is also the moment of the system. So in a certain sense, if you have a linear circuit, you can actually compute moment through experiment and through the computation of the phasors. And so the interesting observation is that now we have a link between the phasor transform and moment. And so this means that we can actually extend uh, the notion of uh, uh, phase of, you know, the notion of phasors to, uh, to nonlinear circuits. And so this actually can be done in a very simple way. So you see, if you have linear components, you have this, uh, uh, you know, basic uh, definition for inductances, capacitance, and resistors. And then the phasor transform essentially is, a, is an operation that transform, you know, inter and derivative in the complex domain as multiplication as division by J omega. Now, this continuous phasor transform is not so so straightforward and is still acting in, in time domain. And you see that what happens actually is that it since you, if you're dealing with a nonlinear circuit, you actually have to consider the dynamical behavior of the circuit, which is represented by this lambda matrix and this time derivative. And then you need to make some adjustment. So essentially this means that if you are going from the linear domain to a nonlinear domain, then at the phase or domain, actually instead of having just an inductance, you need to have an inductance in series with a resistance. And this resistance is associated with the particular regime that the system is operating with. And instead of having a, 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 a capacitor, you need to take a shunt resistance. Now, 
observe that uh, you know in in this particular so in this particular case if uh, you are in a sinusoidal domain then this resistance is equal to zero and this resistance is actually an open circuit so you go back to the previous to the previous expression and the interesting observation is that in this non-linear phasor domain you can actually have a definition of average power and reactive power pretty much like you have in the case of uh, you know the sinusoidal regime Okay, so we have actually seen a direct application of um, you know, the notion of moment and the fact that you can actually get moment from experiment. Uh, we have discussed up to now uh, what happens in the case uh, of um, you know, left interconnection and right interconnection of the generator. And so what I would like to see now, I would like to see what happens, oh, I apologize, if I interconnect both system left and right. Now, to do this double-sided interconnection, I actually have to introduce a new notion, which is the notion of loner matrix, matrix. So this is sometimes called the divided difference matrix. So I have an underlying system, which is driven by a generator and is driving a filter. And then I consider all the eigenvalues of the uh, generator and the uh, eigenvalues of the filter, and these are my interpolation points. And then I construct the loner matrix essentially with a collection of the moment of the system along some particular direction. So this refers to you know, tangential interpolation. Uh, and then I construct the loner matrix. Interestingly enough, the loner matrix can actually be written as the product of uh, a generalized observability matrix and generalized reachability matrix uh, with uh, you know, a minus sign. Now, let's try. Um, to see um, you know, what are the properties of the loner matrix. So the loner matrix actually satisfies uh, a Sylvester equation. So you can solve a Sylvester equation and then uh, you uh, observe that the product minus yx is actually a solution of this Sylvester equation. Unfortunately, this Sylvester equation doesn't have any invariance uh, you know, characterization as far as this cascade is concerned. So the whole idea is to try to understand whether we can actually split this cascade into two sub cascades and see whether, uh, you know, we can have two Sylvester equations which describes, uh, which described, um, you know, an invariance condition. Now, if you look at this, you have, and you know, a sort of right side of this interconnection and the left side, I mean, it's somewhat counterintuitive what is right and what is left, but you need to think of this like operator acting on something and then it, it's perfectly clear. All right, so the way to do this is actually to split the loner matrix into a loner left and loner right, and then write an equation for the loner left and loner right. So then we have two invariance like equation. And so again, we can think of this pretty much in an abstract way without you know, dealing with, linear, with a linear way of thinking. So interestingly enough, the split of the loner matrix into left and right is used because then you can also define something which is called the shifted loner. Now, the shifted loner is the loner matrix which is associated to the time derivative of the output of the system. So if you look at the transfer function, you multiply the transfer function by S, you define the loner matrix and offer this new system. And this is the shifted loner matrix. Now, the shifted left and right loner matrices are actually lead derivative along the interpolation point. And so this is very useful when you are dealing with an, a nonlinear system. There is an additional important properties of loner right and row and left is that they allow to define a change of coordinate that transform this cascade system into a parallel interconnection. And you see that this parallel interconnection is fairly interesting because you have extracted in this parallel interconnection all the objects that you need. You see, you have the generalized reachability, generalized observability, loner right and loner left. And this is the set of interpolation points, the right interpolation point and left interpolation point, and then the underlying system system is actually in the middle branch. So using this, you can actually construct a reduced order mo model in a very simple way. So you uh, collect the moment at lambda i, the moment at mu i, and you use them to construct a, a sort of the input and output matrix. And then your dynamical, your dynamical behavior is described by the inverse of the loner matrix. Clearly, we need to assume that we have as main interpolation point to the left and to the right in order to have a square loner matrix, but all this construction will work well even with a non-square one. Clearly, without the inverse, you need to be slightly more careful. And then, so you have L minus one sigma L as uh, your A matrix. So interestingly enough, 
uh, if you multiply everything by L, you get that L R dot is sigma L R. So this suggests that the autonomous behavior of the interpolating system is such that the shift and the time differentiation actually commute, which is actually a property of the way in which we construct uh, this reduced order system. Now, this uh, system, uh, this result is actually cursed from a time invariant perspective. So, and we'll come back to this. Well, we'll actually illustrate this immediately. If you have a time varying system, then the reduced order system has to include a correction, which is given by the time derivative of loner left and in the A matrix. And you see that this property of, uh, you know, commutation, I would say of the shift of the loner and the time differentiation actually is satisfied only if uh, loner left is actually a constant matrix. And this is typically not the case for a time varying system. All right, so what happens for nonlinear system? Well, essentially, uh, once we set the stage for linear, for, you know, for the linear way of thinking, uh, everything is fairly straightforward, right? So we now take an underlying nonlinear system driven by nonlinear generator and feeding a nonlinear filter, and we need to get two invariants like equation. Uh, there and you know essentially and summarizing here all the steps, but these are straightforward because now we know what we're looking at. So we get, you know, we start with two invariance equations. As a matter of fact, you need to get three equations. So one for uh, uh, capital X, so one for capital Y, and one for loner left. Then you also have the property that loner uh, matrix is the product or actually the composition of the generalized uh, observability function with the generalized reachability function. You have that that the uh, loner right is essentially constructed discounting loner left from the loner function, and then uh, you can still define you know the the, the shifted loner uh, using this expression, and uh, you know you end up with reduced order system, which is actually described by this equation. So you see, this is one of these instances in which things uh, are very misleading in the linear way, right? Because in the linear way, uh, this is a matrix, so the partial value with respect to Z, uh, Xr, and uh, the shifted uh, loner is also a matrix we multiply R, R, R. Now, you see that in this case, on the left, you have a Jacobian, and on the right, you actually have just the, the matrix itself. So the way a matrix actually has to be understood the student nonlinear framework is actually pretty much dependent on the the role of these metrics in 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 in, in your uh, you know in your particular problem formulation. All right, now. Uh, as I said at the very beginning, we have this uh, property of excitability that we have mentioned a few times, and then we would like to discuss a bit more this property. So excitability is a property of an autonomous system, which is initialized at the point omega zero. For linear system, excitability is actually equivalent to reachability of a system, the matrix B of which has been, uh, uh, has been initialized. Um, it um, has been, sorry, the metric B has been selected as the initial condition omega zero. Now, is this the case for nonlinear system as well? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, this is not the case. And it's very simple to see because you uh, get the excitability condition for linear system, which is equivalent to a reachability condition for a system with a matrix B, which is omega zero. You construct what is called the excitation run condition. And then this is, uh, sorry, you construct the excitation distribution, which is essentially, you know, uh, constructed through uh, the, you know, the span of all the vectors that you obtain from S power K omega. And then you look at the dimension of this. Now, reachability of this system is equivalent to the fact that the excitation run condition has actually dimension E, which is the dimension of the state space. And this is true for every omega in some set. Now, interestingly enough, the excitation distribution and the excitation run condition uh, do not rely on linear concept, for example, on the Kelly Hamilton theorem. And so they can be extended to nonlinear system. So, and this is precisely what we do, right? So we take a nonlinear system, we extend this uh, with an input omega zero, and then we construct the excitation distribution. Now we may ask whether excitability of the left-hand side is equal to some reachability property or accessibility property for the right-hand side, but it turns out that the excitation distribution that we've just defined is actually different from the strong accessibility distribution. So the link between reachability and excitability breaks down in a nonlinear frame. Now, excitability is uh, particularly useful 
uh, in various branches of uh, control theory. So suppose, for example, that we would like to characterize uh, the, the, the properties of the trajectory of the system. And then uh, um, suppose that in particular, we're interested in what is called persistence of excitation. Now, it is well known that this property is uh, equivalent to say that the window integral of omega tau times omega tau transpose is actually positive definite matrix for all time t and for some selection of capital T. Now, interestingly enough, this is equivalent to say that the excitation run condition holds for every point in the positive semi-orbit starting from the point uh, uh, omega zero. Now, the interesting fact is that, uh, you know, uh, the excitation run condition is actually a geometric condition that we could check without knowing the properties of the trajectory of the system. Well, here we still need to know the positive semi-orbit, but actually we can extend this because if we have a solution which are analytic and almost periodic, then we just need to check that the excitation run condition is satisfied in the initial condition. And so this is a very useful result because it lets derive properties of trajectory from property of a system. And you know, clearly the excitation distribution only evaluated at one point. All right, now why this is useful? Well, this is useful because, uh, um, well, uh, because for example, in system identification in model reduction, you would like to construct an approximate model from data. And now suppose that you run a bunch of experiment and you know, along these axes, uh, this is you know, the time that it takes for the experiment. Then uh, as time goes by, uh, you try to get your model more and more precise. And you see if the excitation run condition is satisfied, then you actually see that your reduced order model, the body plot of this, so this is a linear system is represented here, is actually approaching as you progress uh, the, the, actual, the actual system, which is the one described by, by the blue line. You see that initially for the first few experiments, the information on the phase of the system is actually very poor, but then as time progresses, you actually converge very nicely to the actual frequency response. All right, another application of excitability is in the study of what are called skew symmetric system. So skew symmetric system, for example, show up in adaptive control. So suppose that you have a system which is described by an equation like x dot equal minus phi, phi transpose x. Typically phi is regressor and this is a parameter estimation error system in adaptive control. Or sometimes in mechanical system where the system ABC is a passive system, then uh, you have uh, this skew type of skew symmetric properties. And so you would like to study stability of the system with very little information on fee. So if, for example, you know that the regressor fee or uh, you know the signal fee which may be coming from interconnection in a mechanical system is almost periodic the excitation run condition is satisfied and you have a minimality assumption on the underlying system then you can conclude uniformly global exponential stability of uh, you know the zero equilibrium of the X system with very little information on trajectory of omega and in particular without computing the integral all right so uh, uh, this brings us nicely uh, to discussing adaptive control problem. And in particular, I would like to understand uh, where is the course of linearity and time invariance in adaptive control. So classical adaptive control um, and the so-called I and I adaptive control are two very well-known control methodologies which are used to uh, well, the design adaptive control, uh, adaptive control. Now, the uh, classical adaptive control can almost always be reinterpreted as uh, uh, you know, the design of an update law that creates a passive interconnection. Whereas the INI adaptive control allows to update, to create an update law, which creates an L2 stable cascade. Now, actually this works in the time invariant case, because if you have, for example, a very simple dynamical system, and you know, the fact that this is nonlinear is somewhat irrelevant in this discussion. So your parameter is actually not a constant, but is a function of time. So if you use a, a classical adaptive control and you try to use passivity, you end up with an additional external signal, which is essentially theta dot. And you see, when I mentioned that you should keep track of constant, this is like the time derivative of theta should be kept track of, uh, even if theta is a constant, because you know, if theta is even slowly time-bind, there is an additional input and you know the whole notion of passivity breaks down 
in the INI adaptive control, you go from a nice cascade where, you know, essentially you have an L2 stable system in X and a system Z, which describes the parameter estimation error, which generates an L2 disturbance. All of a sudden, everything is driven by theta dot. And so your L2 properties actually are destroyed. And the interesting observation is that not only the properties are destroyed, but, you know, the selection of the adaptation gain shows up in the strength of the signal, which means that occasionally you may think the strengthening adaptation or making the adaptation gain faster may actually improve performance, but this may not be the case. All right, so the way we actually deal with this is using what is called the congelation of variable method. So we recognize that the parameter theta hat that shows up in adaptive control is nothing else that uh, a dynamical signal that has to be used to create an interconnection which has some passivity property it has nothing to do with an estimate of the parameter theta because under general assumption you cannot really conclude that theta hat converges to theta and so the whole idea is to replace theta which is a function of time with some unknown constant l theta and so construct a new passive interconnection now, this can also be uh, done in a modular way. So suppose that you have, uh, you know, two parameters, one in the input channel and one multiplying in nonlinearity. So you start with, uh, you know, replacing the parameter theta with, uh, you know, a congealed parameter L theta. You replace the inverse of B with a congealed L beta, and then you keep on doing, you know, passive interconnection. And so you end up with repeated uh, application of the passivity theorem. Okay, so as a matter of fact, you know, this could be extended to a large class of nonlinear systems, and we don't really want to go into all the details of these. The interesting observation is actually represented in these graphs. So when you're actually studying adaptive control problem for time invariant system, you are neglecting some interconnection among the systems. And these show up as soon as you have time varying parameters. So having time varying parameter is such that, for example, this partial cascade interconnection becomes a feedback loop. And also in, in I and I adaptive control, you know, you have some additional term, for example, this interconnection that destroys uh, the, uh, you know, the stability properties of the system and the structural properties of the system. So we've actually devised um, a, a sort of, uh, you know, network based approach to look at this. And you see, you may start asking yourself whether, you know, the presence of this interconnection actually can be counteracted by a better controller in this location. Now, in this particular example, this is not going to work because you see that this node here is actually not part of a recycle. You see, there is a cycle here. And so a good controller in this location will not actually prevent an instability mechanism. What you would like to have, you would like, for example, to have a good node on this location because this is now a sub node which is contained in every cycle. And so essentially, uh, we have designed, you know, defined a notion of active nodes, which are the green nodes, and they should be located in, uh, um, in, you know, in a position such that every cycle includes an active node. So you see in this example, this is at the center. And so a, whatever cycle you can consider for this graph, there is a green node, which means that just selecting a controller in this location will let you counteract the presence of any disturbance and also in this particular example. All right, so uh, this nicely brings us to the last uh, part of the talk, which has to do with optimal control. So the whole idea is now to try to understand whether we can exploit the principle of optimality and uh, well, the time minimum principle and dynamic programming in order to get a new perspective for, um, for optimal control. Now for linear system, the basic ingredient are the underlying system, uh, the cost that we assume over an infinite horizon, and then we have the Riccati equation and the associated Hamiltonian matrix. Now let's try to have a geometric interpretation, I would say graphical interpretation of all of this. Suppose that I pick an initial condition X0 and suppose that K star is the optimal feedback. Then I propagate uh, with time uh, this initial condition along the optimal flow and then at time T, uh, I actually lift the solution into this sort of uh, Hamiltonian system and using the solution of the Riccati equation. And then I backward propagate this along the trajectory of the Hamiltonian system. Now, if uh, K star is the optimal feedback and if P star is the uh, associated solution of the Riccati equation, then after I forward propagated the optimal closed loop system and backward propagated the Hamiltonian system, and then I 
perform a projection on the X space, then I go back to X zero. So essentially, uh, this is a loop that starts from X zero and brings back X zero. And the interesting observation is that, so essentially this strange mapping, forward flowing, lifting, backward flowing and projection is actually an identity. And this is an identity for every positive T. Right, so it doesn't really matter for how long or how short, so to speak, you flow backward and forward. Now, let's try to do things in the opposite direction because they provide a good characterization of non-optimality. So suppose that I pick an initial point, x0 lambda zero star, and where lambda zero star is actually on the invariant, man, invariant subspace of the Hamiltonian matrix, I forward flow along the trajectory of the Hamiltonian system. So this is an optimal process, so to speak. I do a projection, uh, on the x uh, on the x axis and I go backward in time along the trajectory of the optimal closed loop system. So if I go along this red line and then essentially the x zero that I obtain is exactly the same x zero where I start. However, if for whatever reason my lambda zero star is not the correct one, then I still flow forward along the Hamiltonian system and do the projection and fall, go backward in time along some system which is not optimal. And so you see that I reach a point x zero prime. Now the area of these, uh, you know, the size of the area of, of this shaded region is actually a measure of non-optimality. So if this is equal to zero, then uh, I have an optimal control. I have an optimal, the solution to the optimal control problem is this is different from zero, then I'm away from optimality. And so the whole idea is that I should try to minimize this area in some, in some clever way. All right, so let's try to summarize what are the ingredients. So I need to find the optimal control K star uh, as to satisfy a stability condition and to satisfy a fixed point condition, which can actually be characterized in terms of projection, in terms of backward flow and forward flow. And so all of these can actually be done for nonlinear system. So there is an interesting interpretation in terms of Riccati equation, which we believe we can skip. Uh, and so what happens for nonlinear system? Well, essentially we have exactly the same ingredients. So in nonlinear system, the cost, uh, the hamilton jacobi equation, and then the Hamiltonian function, the Hamiltonian system, where recall that the matrix J is actually skews in metric. Okay, so things here are slightly more twisted because this is a nonlinear system, but the, the way of thinking is exactly the same. You start from X zero, lambda zero star, you flow forward along the Hamiltonian system, you project on the X axis, you flow backward along the optimal solution, the solution of the optimal closed loop system, and you go back to X zero. If for whatever reason, you don't go back to X zero, but you go to some X zero prime, it means that you didn't start on the optimal lambda zero star. And so this means essentially that the optimal feedback had to satisfy a stability condition and the fixed point condition. The interesting observation of this fixed point condition is that this is true for every T. So we can actually assume that this is true, uh, you know, for T equal to zero. And then we start doing time derivative as a function of T and replace T equal to zero. So this is nothing else than, uh, you know, a property of a differential operator. So this equation has to be satisfied by X zero and Lambda zero. And so this is a way, for example, of computing Lambda zero. So uh, this is actually amenable to compute very accurate approximation of the optimal control law without solving any partial differential equation. All right, so I believe in terms of some takeaway messages and you know, I've not been massively over time uh, that linearity and time invariants are very powerful uh, structure, which however may be misleading. And so a careful study of linear time invariant system with abstract tool allows to develop a non-linear time invariant enhancement of analysis and design tool and to improve our understanding of essential feature interaction. So de facto breaking, breaking the course of linearity and time invariance. I really need to thank lots of people for this and they're all listed here from my mentor, Professor Isidori, some long-term collaborator and all my PhD students and, and postdoc that have worked with me over the year. So thank you very much for this and I look forward to you know, some discussion or questions. Well, Professor Astolf, uh, we thank you for your very excellent talk today. Uh, now we have some time for questions. Anyone can open your microphones or write something on the chat to ask Professor Alessandro Astolf. Anyone? Well, Professor, I have a question about yep. uh, optimal control. Um, I saw your slides about the basic nonlinear ingredients. Uh, you talk about a functional minimum of an integral, something like that. 
there is a norm, a term uh, that is norm of u at power two. Okay. Yes. My question is, if, you if we can change this power to potential to power four, example, we have a result. What what happens in well, this case? Uh, okay, so power it, four. the only thing that you really need at this case is you need convexity <laughs> of uh, you know this. Please. I say the only thing that you really need is convexity of this functional with respect. Uh, convexity. To okay. Right. So then, so that when you uh, sort of mean you can perform this minimization so you know quadratic is very okay. uh professor <laughs> please again yeah so what i was saying is that you just need convexity with respect to u of okay. this functional and then i mean clearly okay, the convex. hamilton jacob equation will be slightly different but as long as you can perform this minimization i mean it doesn't really matter okay. whether it's two norm or anything else. okay okay i understand well thank you professor um there is anyone to make questions for Professor Alessandro Strupi? Well, um, if you don't have any more questions, let's thank right. Professor Strupi again for your very, very excellent talk. Okay. All right. Now okay. we'll have some words from Juan Lima. Okay.